Hello folks, I hope you are doing good. I would like to welcome you to the introductory lecture of course EE614 titled Solid State Devices. This is from the Electrical Engineering Department. IIT Kanpo. I am Krishna Balasubramanian. And I am an assistant professor in the electrical engineering. I sit at WL121 IITK. You can reach me in the email ID IITK or on the phone 2138 from the internal lines. The teaching assistance and all the other information regarding the course will be provided in due course. At the time this lecture was made, it was not decided yet. So, before we dive into this uh, course in detail, let us have a, a very short note on why do we study solid, solids particularly and why do we study solid state devices. So, for the purpose of this particular course, let's define a particular number called as number density. Okay, Let's call it ND. It's just number of, let us say, atoms, okay, per centimeter cube. Now, let us say if we are, if we, if we try to organize the things that we know in terms of this particular number, okay. So, the first thing, let us say, the most rarest being the interstellar space. Can we guess what will be the number density? Like what is the density of atoms per centimeter cube? It is about 10 power 6 atoms per centimeter cube. Okay. Let us come a little bit closer. Let us say our atmosphere and air. It is a whooping 0 0.025 into 10 to the power 21 atoms per centimeter cube. So already there is about 10 power 15 atoms per centimeter cube difference. Right just the space and the air and the most common solid that we know the solid that we all like let us say diamond okay has a density of 176.2 into 10 to the power 21 so basically it is about five orders more denser than the air so the question now being what makes this solid so special how can you have something which is so dense in comparison to the, all the others and it has some very interesting properties right some of them have very funny colors so the question is uh, why solids have these funny colors some of them conduct right and some don't why they have such different electrical properties The biggest definition or the, the biggest property of any solid is it provides uh, it is distinguished it is distinguished from from other forms like liquids and gases by the fact that it resists force either in perpendicular or parallel to the surface. So let us say so it provides a resisting force. either perpendicular or parallel to the surface. So the questions that we are trying to answer is why are solids so special and why do they have such following properties, right? So before we dive in deep into answering all these things, we will have a short historical perspective, right? Depending upon what have been identified before the point in which we begin our course, 
okay for doing this we will start right at the basic definition of atom right what is atom and where it was defined atom comes from a greek word which means indivisible it was actually founded in 1803 by dalton where he was doing some uh, experiments with chemical reactions and he found that the the elements for instance oxygen and tin they always reacted in whole number proportions right so once so at this point let us uh, stop and deliberate at few landmark experiments okay these were done in the in the uh, in the late 1800s to understand the nature of uh, electrons or the constituent particles of atoms okay one of the most important experiment was conducted by J.J. J. Thomson okay, in the year 1897. He was trying to figure out the... So basically at this point people knew that the electrons were negatively charged, right? And he was trying to figure out the exact value of charge and the mass of the electron. But however, he managed to only find the ratio of charge by mass. Okay, He had this very elaborate setup. At that time, it was known that if you apply a large negative potential to a metal, you will be able to knock out an electron and the electron will will, will travel at the velocity V okay, outside the metal. Now, you have to find out what is the velocity of the V. You have to find the velocity of the electron um, V, right? So, to do that, so he had two perpendicular fields, the electric field and the magnetic field, to the path of the electron let us say the electron is going in this path in this direction he had two fields electric and magnetic field now do we know a relation between the the electric and magnetic fields and the and its effect on the uh, electron velocity and the relationship is called or called by the lorentz equation or called the lorentz force lorentz force f is E times E, where E capital E being the uh, electric field and small e being the charge plus the charge and the velocity cross product with the magnetic field. The cross product is just a measure of perpendicularity, right? It tells or it is a it's, it just it's a measure of how perpendicular is the magnetic field and the velocity of the electron, right? And what he did was he ensured that the electric and magnetic field were equal and the path of the electron is not deflected and when you have such condition you can put the total force to be zero it is still moving with the force in which it was knocked out right it has a velocity v and when this force is zero you can very easily see that you can determine what is the velocity e this e by b if b is perpendicular to the velocity that's how the experiment was set up you know the velocity right now that you know the velocity, you know the distance from here to here, you know the time it takes and if you just switch off the magnetic field, the only thing that is acting is the electric field after, after measuring the velocity of course, right? So now what happens is the electron gets deflected from its path, the electron which was moving like this gets deflected and then goes through this path and once if you know this distance y, Thomson found out that you can actually have a measure of E by N. It's pretty straightforward, right? Now, this is Newtonian mechanics and it is just like a projectile motion. And how do you calculate the projectile? At any instant, you assume there is no lateral velocity initially and any displacement is just half a t square. And A being gravity, Newtonian mechanics, here A is just e e by n right it comes from the force and that's how the acceleration is you know this y because you know where it hit and you know the time because you know the velocity right so now you can very quickly calculate the ratio so basically uh, your y is half e by m e 
So now you know the measure of E by M. Then came another very interesting experiment conducted by Millikan. So he determined the electronic charge to very high precision. So how do you determine charge? It follows from the previous experiment, right? So basically, you just need to somehow have a charge particle. So he had, so he had some some very elaborate setup like this. He he somehow put a charge particle here. Okay, let it slowly fall down, and he had a small electric small gap surrounded by electric plate in which he can apply the force. So if I zoom this particular area, so he had two electric plates like this, and somehow a small opening in this such that the charge droplet can fall down and it is actually falling down with some gravity right some force some velocity now once this is given he applied an electric field such that this guy will stop moving any further down it is held there so how will you do that it's easy right so you, you need to know the forces acting on this guy and then you have to balance it out with the electric field so that it is it is hung it is hanging right the forces on this is pretty straightforward it is the gravity so the gravity is 4 by 3 pi r cube radius of this droplet volume into density right can anybody tell why this is true have you heard of apparent mass? I want to take a look at this. Okay, Archimedes and, and the famous Eureka, right? So this is the this is the this is the gravitational force, and this was conducted in air. So there was also some small viscous force of the air, which also depends upon the velocity, right? Eta being the viscosity, v being the velocity. So. If, 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 if it has reached a constant velocity, that means the effect, the total force acting on it is zero. So basically you can, you can do F minus FV equal to zero and identify what is the velocity in which it is falling down. And, and this is the velocity at which it is falling down here, right? Now, once it comes to this particular gap, you are applying a field and that field as we previously saw is EE, right? And this is equivalent to any of these uh, velocities, right? It's an equal to any of these force. So once if you equal it, equate it to 4 by 3 pi r cube rho minus rho r into g, such that everything is stopped. You see that you can easily calculate the, uh, the charge because all other things are known. You, because this velocity was dropped to zero, you can, well, once, you, once you know the velocity, you know what is the, what is the radius and you can calculate everything from here. Right? So now you know the electric charge, from electric charge you can calculate the, uh, the, the, the mass of the electron and so forth. Now that the information about the, uh, the charge is known, People were thinking what is the relationship between the the atom and the relationships between the various components in the atom, right? And therein comes Rutherford. So before he came in, the thought was the uh, the atom looked like a looked like a plum cake. So basically, it had largely distributed positive charge. So let's say like this, and that it had small negatively charged plums right but then Rutherford said okay fine now let me do this particular experiment so he put the gold foil here right and and he was able to send in alpha particles from here right it came out through here from here now you can question how did they get alpha particles right can we answer this? How did Rutherford, Giger, Martin get alpha particles at that time, right? He found that 
they get scattered by angles more than 90 degrees and many of them got scattered right if it is actually distributed like this the alpha particles will just go through with very few scatterings but then he saw many of them got scattered by large angles so in conclusion rutherford thought that the atom is not like what uh, thomson thought rather it is it has a highly concentrated positive charge and then you have electrons going all around it right actually moving or accelerating however they had a lot of problems with this right we all know about that an accelerating electron will have to emit energy and it has to it has to collapse down so the atom is no longer stable right while all these things were happening right the electrical engineers were not silent so they were working on vacuum tubes starting as early as 1880s right we all know about edison's patent of electric bulbs and they were actually also being used for rectifiers because uh, because of communication equipments right so the basic principle in which a rectifier works is you have a vacuum um, or uh, and, and, and you have a vacuum uh, chamber and you have a coil here right if the coil is sufficiently heated it has an ability to knock out an electron which goes from the coil to the outer shell thereby connecting thereby conducting right can you think why it rectifies basically these things were patented by the rectifier was patented by fleming but then why does it rectify why does it not work the other way around the answer lies in the fact that the cathode is heated basically you need to heat the cathode for you to eject the electron out right and the anode is not heated so it is not as efficient in emitting an electron as it is with it in comparison with cathode and hence it just conducts in only in one direction now there is following this uh, uh, vacuum rectifier vacuum tube uh, experiments there was this photoelectric experiments which played a huge role in understanding the nature of light and its interaction with the, with, with matter you take the same vacuum tube uh, example so you have the cathode here and you have the anode here right it was identified that if you shine light on the cathode you are able to get some current through it right and and the current through it right depends only on the wavelength of the light and not on the intensity you know this is a very important thing so basically it just says that if you bombard this particular plate with light of let us say red and longer and longer wavelengths it is just not enough what actually change is if you change the wavelength of the light right and this problem and subsequent explanation by einstein of course gave him the nobel prize but then it's a landmark experiment another series of experiments starting as early as 1756 can you think about from where they had this vacuum basically this was done this was in each a vacuum uh, region right where you need uh, let us say discharge from a gas this was atomic gas lines so basically they had discharge from gases in uh, in chambers so instead of exciting so basically let's go back to same thing here right so if you take these bulbs and then fill it with gases they saw that each gas had a characteristic line as shown here right so basically you also need this vacuum tubes and somehow excite the gases there and how do you excite gases the excitation happens as the electron is being pushed from the cathode as we show here right as we show by this uh, uh, coils 
as the electron runs from this coil to the from the cathode the an, to the anode it ionizes the gases thereby exciting the the electrons i'm i'm mixing a lot of things here which is which was not known there before but then it, it was the reason in which you got these specific lines however they expected a continuous spectrum the biggest surprise in this atomic gas lines were they had the sharp lines as designated by these wavelengths and did not get a continuous spectrum so i have a question for you why did they expect a continuous spectrum Can you answer this question? It's very straightforward. It comes from the black body radiations. Anyways, but I will uh, I will leave it up to you for you to explain why they expect uh, a continuous spectrum and they uh, and they got these uh, sharp lines. So, but then these sharp lines were the, the the biggest surprise was so they had these several series of lines right called the Lyman lines, the Balmer lines, and the Pasteur lines. The biggest surprise. was that you take the lyman lines and then subtract one from the other you started to get the balmer lines and you take the balmer lines and subtract one from the other and got the pasteur lines so the question was why is this like this why do they why do the lines have this these particular relationships it was answered by bohr right he thought that the atoms should have electrons in well defined radiuses so let us say this is your radius this is your nucleus so he said that the electrons can stay only in well defined uh, radius and this radi- in addition to this radius he told that the electrons possess very well defined momentum so he said the momentum of the electron are quantized and have these particular values he assumed this where h bar is the reduced planck's constant h is a planck's constant by 2 pi this is h bar and n being any natural number right he assumed that you have this now from where did this assumption come from there was a guy called de broglie he came up with an uh, this suggestion that every particle with mass m and the velocity v must be associated with a wave whose wavelength is lambda and which is defined by this relation h by p h by mv into root 1 minus v square by v square now this is the relativistic correction forget it but for all our current discussions we can have lambda is equal to h by m right so once we take de broglie's uh, wave picture and we see that an electron somewhere here right now the electron is a wave so it has to go around this particular path and come back to itself right so for this particular condition to be true it has to be n times the lambda n times the the wavelength should be equal to 2 pi r the circumference of this ring in which the electron lies right and this gives you the expression of the momentum is n h by 2 pi which is equal to n h bar so basically if you if you take the de broglie's equation you can actually derive uh, uh, bohr's assumption but then bohr did not stop there right he showed that if i take an electron right and then calculate the centripetal force which is trying to push the electron let us say an electron here like this and and the attractive force from the coulomb so basically the coulombic attractive force is z ke the coulomb constant e square by the radius square and the centripetal force is e square by r you can actually calculate the the radiuses and then you can calculate the energy once you calculate the energy you can calculate to see these these energy levels from which they are in 
and the difference comes when the electron jumps from one energy level to the other giving you this atomic loss. So at this point we will stop because we already have or we already saw some, some notion of how the electrons are in an atom and from the next class onwards the next time we meet we will try to see how the electrons can be thought of as in a, in a metal how do they contribute to conduction and what are the relationships how do we how do we get our very famous ohm's law and then uh, and then let's see from 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 there on how do we calculate the hall coefficient and so on and so forth in the next class thank you so much